Hi. Hello, Ella. Good afternoon. How lovely to see you. How are you? I'm fine, and how are you? Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you. Do you hear me? Uh, I just need to put the volume up a little bit. Okay. You hear me? Yeah, not very well. Um, let me change my earphones. Is it better now? Oh my God, so much better. Fab. Okay. <laughs> So hot here, I'm melting. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so my I'm moving house, so my bookshelves are completely empty. So I just tried to put some books there because it looked. Yeah, cool. bla I see Black Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, fab. Okay. I'm ready when you are. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this 20-minute conversation for the 2020 Abuja. Victorian Arts Festival. My name is Otus Rezobiang and our guest is Ella P. Wakatama, whom I admire so much. <laughs> She's one of my professional models. How are you doing, Ella? I'm doing really well. It's hot in London, so I'm melting, but um, we've just recovered from the 20th Cane Prize, so one less thing to worry about. Went really well. Yeah, so thank you for joining us ahead of the festival. So Ella P. Wakatama, officer of the British Empire, was born in 1966 in present-day Zimbabwe. She is editor at large at Canon Gate and was the founding publishing director of the Indigo Press. She is a creative Manchester senior research fellow at the School of New Writing, University of Manchester, and she serves as the chair of the Cocaine Prize for African Writing. She is former deputy editor of Granta Magazine and senior editor at Jonathan Cape, Random House. She is the editor of the anthologies Africa 39, New Writing from Africa, South of the Sahara, and Safe House Explorations in Creative Nonfiction. Her journalism has appeared in The Telegraph, The Guardian and Observer, and in Spectator and The Griffith Review. She contributed to the New Daughters of Africa anthology, a judge for the 2017 Dublin Literary International Award, and for the 2015 Man Booker Prize, Ella is a trustee of the Royal Literary Fund and sits on the advisory board of art and of Art for Amnesty and the editorial advisory panel of the Johannesburg Review of Books. She was visiting professor and global and intercultural scholar at Goshen College, Indiana, and guest master at the Gerber Gashia Marquess Fellowship in Cartagena, Colombia. She is currently a mentor for the literary consultancy. Ella has a BA in journalism from Goshen College and an MA in communication, information, and library studies from Rutgers University. Welcome once again, Ella. Thank you. I, I love that mention of colleges. They seem so far away. <laughs> yeah, I, there was a time I researched them in 2019, but yeah, fine. <laughs> so I want to begin with your most recent engagement with the literary consultancy as a mentor for Black British writers. What do you look for when you read manuscripts by writers you're hoping to either mentor or take on as an editor? That's a lovely, that's a lovely first question. The Literary Consultancy is one of the few manuscript advisory services that was accredited by the council. It was funded by my late friend, um, and she, um, you know, she she founded this Becky Clark and she did this. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna have to cut it. Was, it's Becky Swift, and she consultancy, and it's now being headed up by her team and former colleague Aki Schultz and they came up with this idea because they wanted to find a way to respond to all of awareness around the Black Lives Matter movement and Aki and I were really of the same mind that we did performative just to and so um, I loved her very practical idea of we could offer the services of the literary consultancy to a black British writer because most of the problem is lack of access. And sometimes lack of access only means anybody in publishing. You don't know anybody who can give you editorial support. My feeling talent is always there. 
but um, you know, I've been an editor for over two decades now, and I know that it can make for a writer to have best readers, somebody who really engages with their work and pushes them to do their best. So to say, what am I looking for in a manuscript? Not perfection. For me, it's always really simple. I want to feel if this hadn't written this story, they would have just died or combusted. Um, I like lad on guts on the page. That's that it came from somebody's heart. And so sometimes my, my heart sinks if I see too many because I think often what that does is it tells the right plot plausible characters and lovely sentences that thing in the end. I'd rather have something that had all kinds of fault, but was just full of this kind of urgent desire to tell a story. And at this point in time, I'm really interested in writers who spend time the right form for their story. Um, thing new. And you know, for example, I think of um, an orchestra of monies, the you know most recent short, short book of short. Because you're book, yeah. that, yes, exactly. And thinking about how Chigozier had has has taken from cultural oral traditions, but also um, from storytelling traditions from other places, and creating in, in terms of voice and form to tell this deeply compelling story that has a kind of contemporary urgency. And all the, the writers I love right now are looking out for. Yeah, so what you said about Chigozia relates to my next question. When you were an editor at um, Cape, you were responsible for a group of writers there, including Brian Chikova, Helen Habila, Billy Band B. Bandele, and Peter Akinti all of whom were for the 2000s breakout generation. So to what extent is it advisable? And I ask this because it's easy to prioritize viability over originality. So to what extent is it advisable for upcoming writers to emulate successful models by authors who have gone before them? And if you're looking at the case of Chigo Siubiyama, he his first two novels have been shortlisted and shortlisted for the Booker Prize. So if a writer decides to emulate him and try to do what they are doing at the expense of originality, and of course there's market forces and everything. So what, what would you advise, essentially? Good question. Um, just a correction. I, I, I was never had on published in. I'm very jealous. I wish I had been, but I wasn't. <laughs> okay. But the rest, yes. And maybe he'll hear this and, and you know, come my way. But anyway, um, okay. No, it's not advisable to emulate them. I mean, emulating them, which is a use, may mean commercial success because it has to be acknowledged that all publishers are the same thing. If one thing works, they want another one. You could go that route. It's not going to lead to critical success and it won't lead to long. So, why would you be someone else if you could be yourself? You know, I think that, you know, of a writer is so difficult. You have to have that question because it's very rare that you can make you know, which is often you see, you know, those six figure deals. Those are so rare. I, I rarely pay, you know, that, that much for a book, you know, because publishing is it's, to some extent a gambling business. You are commissioning a book you are what you would like to read and imagining other readers out there. And of course you put lots of work into selling it but it's still a bit of a gamble no i wouldn't say emulate them but i would absolutely because reading them means that you can find out different ways i often say to first-time novelists i'm working with if they're having trouble i'll give them a read this author for character read this author for plot this author for beautiful sentences and that's not to say copy them it's to say what the possibilities are and then think about stories, spend time with your own characters and come up with your own So I would absolutely say that they have to read them, but that's as far as it goes. Yeah, but not to emulate. As a prose editor and as one who has mostly worked on fiction, non-fiction, yeah, but mostly on fiction, and one who now chairs their cooking prize, a short fiction award, 
what is it that makes a great short story for you? For the prior to judge, because I would actually like to be in my mind and not, not collaborate <laughs> just yeah. as well. I short story. I mean, I teach, and I think that you know how to write because a short story, a moment in time, it capture an idea and thousand words to create a whole story. Um, I often start flash fiction because, you know, there's this wonderful fiction and the entire story is, says, for sale, one pair of baby shoes, never worn. And that's the story. I think yeah. it's perfect because it had a whole universe of sorrow and loss within. Of course, short stories aren't all that. It's a really good example of of what a short story has to do. You have very little space and you have to pack intensity into it and it has to stand by it. And I'm always looking for writers who have the ability to fully characters within that form, but who are also able to extract a theme, what they want. That's the other things I do when I'm teaching is I say, tell me what the story is and don't mention plot. Or character and, okay. and then it's so difficult to do but then once you do that it really is about the short story grows out of things that I'm looking for and you know I'm always a sucker for beautiful sentences nothing can <laughs> ride a wave of yeah. mellifluous prose I'm happy <laughs> yeah so do, do you have a favorite short story I have a couple of favorite short stories. There's one called Pounds by Mia Kuto. Uh, there's one called The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas by Ursula Le Guin. And uh, there's another one, American sort of Southern Gothic writer, Shirley Jackson. Is it The um, Lottery? Yes, by Novalek Bulawayo. I mean, anyone who's been... And one of my classes knows those are my favorite because those are the ones I end up teaching. But to me, those are very different examples of amazing short stories. And then I the NKOK came prize, um, Skin, um, Leslie, Leslie Arima. Yeah, that is just heart stopping. So those are my favorites. The little if you ask me again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, you talked about um, the response, the response of publishing to the Black Lives Matter um, movements, one of which is the, uh, the literary consultants you work with them. So you have worked on three continents, Europe, Africa, South America, and in different capacities. What do you believe has held back not just writers, but editors, curators, journalists of non-white backgrounds? What has held them back from getting to the center of publishing? Okay, so um, I don't think we've been held back and I would dispute the idea of the center. I'm very interested in moving that center yeah. because for our um, just to be sustainable, the center has to be moved. I mean, the Heinemann African so much, but the center was not on the continent. And your hold, the, the phrase you use, held back, probably refers to that period of time where there was so enough coming out of the continent. And that's because the boom that had happened ha happened elsewhere. And, and, you know, one has to be grateful for it. There was a vision there. And, it, you know, it meant that stories were told. And um, in interest right now, as well as acknowledging that as Africans, we are both at home and that, that diaspora is always still an African experience. So I acknowledge that. But on the other hand, what I in, you know, even in my professional life, is how do we create our own center? Because we have to be not only the stories, but the production of our own story. And so for someone like Bibi Bakari, who is under a 
admire hugely because she started off in, in Abuja, Nigeria, and now she's here in London. But focused on the idea of the means of production being not just the talent that you then export elsewhere, as if you were exporting coltan, you know, for, for we export our rices. That's a very difficult thing to do. You know, another woman I admire greatly is Goriti Chomiando, who is from Uganda, the founder of the African Uganda. Writers' Trust. I've Writers. worked with her several times, um, doers and publishers, skills development. I, I felt back, many of us live in very difficult political economies. Hard to make a living as a publisher or a writer, let bright young minds go elsewhere. You know, we are held back by the expense of books because it's very hard to make a living from books. So it's have to choose between school shoes and novels. And you know, you know which one wins, right? And so those things can say hold us back. What doesn't hold us back is the need for talent. We have that, or the ability to work hard. We have that in droves. And so, you know, Goretti's organization, African Writers Trust, is all about publishing professionals, literary professionals from diaspora and also from African countries that have had more success in, in this literary field to share their skills. And I think she's made a difference. I think, you know, her work is, along with that of, of other African publishers like, like BB, um, is so, you know, question. I think I'd want to fight you on the phrasing, especially the <laughs> back. Um, because I feel very positive. I feel that, you know, I'm always very, you know, my father and, um, I always thought that what I wanted to do was to write. And luckily, because he also was a publisher later on, I realized that what I wanted was to make books and making books for me means being a publisher. And so when I'm doing the teaching of editorial skills, I'm teaching because I imagine, you know, if I was still in Harare and I was an 18 year old now, I'd probably imagine that I wanted to win the AKO Kane Prize when actually what I am is I'm a, I'm a good editor. I'm not that great a, a writer, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, so I want to make those possibilities and I want to work with people who are making those possibilities. So in 50 years time, when we look back, the center is wherever we say it is. Yeah, I, I, love, <laughs> I love the idea of you flipping the question. Yeah, it's, it's good. So um, what are you reading currently? Say that again. What are you reading right now? What, what am are I you reading? reading? Yes. What am I reading currently? So one of my jobs is to um, commission fiction for, um, I, it hasn't been announced yet, so I won't say, but it, it's, it's, it's for an organization. I'm commissioning original fiction for them. Um, I said I could do it if I could do crime and science fiction and erotica, because you know, I'm a literary publisher. Yeah. And I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's sort I, I of read, strange. <laughs> yeah, hello, I read, um, I read promiscuously. I have, I have no, you know, I read everything. My, my late friend being a Van Gogh and I introduced me to romance novels, and I got completely hooked because I'd never read them. I was too old to read them. So now, in my fifties, I discovered them for the first time. But this was an opportunity when I had this invitation to, to be sort of a consulting editor. This was an, um, an opportunity for me to indulge in my love of science fiction. Um, I really like crime writing and I'd never published erotica and I wondered what I like. And so I have a series of books to come out and not all of the writers are African, but the majority are, and they are writing deep within these genres. And so that's one thing that, that is preoccupying me. So that's a lot of research trying to find writers because I'm inviting people to to write these books for me and so I trawl the internet looking for um, African science fiction writers who are writing short stories to see where there's an idea that can be developed and, and yeah, right now I'm moving house after 30 years in the same house so I don't oh, really have it. the strength but the book that is I have two books that are on 
top of my packing go next to my bed first and it one of them is the first woman by jennifer makumbi chintu second one is jack by marilyn robinson so it's super focused for more than five minutes those are my marilyn robinson <laughs> absolutely i adore her <laughs> Yeah, I do too. I mean, yeah. So thank you so much, Ella. You've been very open and helpful with your answers. So, and I really and wish the great conversation. <laughs> yeah, I wish the conversation would have been longer, but yeah, fine. And for making our time to join us ahead of the festival. Good luck with the festival. I'm sorry I can't show on you, but best wishes. Yeah, thank you.